Tonight, Microsoft gives Xbox a pretty big update. iOS 8 wants to suggest apps to you and how to shut down a glass hole. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 101 for Wednesday, June 4th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Full Sail University. Full Sail offers both online and campus degree programs centered on real world experience in the entertainment, media, and technology industries. For more information, visit fullsail.edu slash TN2. I'm Sarah Lane, hello everyone, and let's get right into the tech feed. Microsoft is rolling out a pretty big update to allow Xbox One owners to use external hard drives with their consoles, also control their TVs using the One Guide interface, and even see their friends' actual names on Xbox Live rather than just handles. The update also brings improvements to the Xbox Smart Glass companion app, lets Xbox owners use 180 apps, new apps like Netflix and Hulu, without needing that $60 per year Xbox Live Gold subscription. Xbox... Updated Xbox One consoles will support up to two external USB 3.0 compatible hard drives. That feature wasn't available at the console's launch, but will be. External drives will automatically become the default installation location for Xbox One games when they're connected, but they will need to be more than 256 gigabytes of storage to be seen by the console. The company doesn't have a specific date, but says updates should start rolling out globally this week. Intel announced at the annual Computech show today that its next generation platform codenamed Skylake will eventually eliminate cables entirely from the PC. Hooray! The high-speed Y-Gig standard will be used as the short-range docking technology, which creates a connection to a screen and peripherals when a device is moved within range and then swaps back out to standalone usage if it's picked up and moved away. YGIG delivers speeds of up to 7 gigabits per second. Resonance is the name of the magnetic resonance charging technology that Skylake will use, promoted by the Alliance for Wireless Power that Intel is aligned with. The system can be installed under a table interface or surface with magnetic resonance capable of charging through two inches of wood. It can also charge any number of devices at the same time, which is unlike inductive charging technologies that exist today. Skylake isn't expected until the second half of this year, though, so devices based on this reference design probably won't hit the market until 2016. Still nice to know they're coming. Is Amazon finally unveiling a smartphone? Probably. The company is holding a product announcement on June 18th, and along with the announcement of the announcement, Amazon posted a video to YouTube that teases this device with people that are kind of moving their heads around and appearing very happy. Amazon's smartphone is said to have several front-facing cameras that can track your head's movement and display images on the screen in a way that appear to pop out in 3D. Now, in addition to this upcoming device, and of course it's Kindle Fire line of tablets, Amazon now also has Fire TV, the set-top box that allows you to stream video from Amazon, and of course other popular services like Netflix, and then also acts as a gaming system for some Android games. The event on the 18th will take place in Seattle and will be open to the public. So get in there if you want to. AT&T recently named 100 municipalities in 21 metropolitan areas where it could potentially build out its fiber to the home network shortly before the company announced a deal to buy satellite provider DirecTV for $48.5 billion. However, AT&T told the Sec Securities and Exchange Commission in a filing yesterday that it needs approval of this DirecTV merger in order to bring fiber to 2 million locations, give or take. The expansions would happen within four years, AT&T said, as combining the companies would let the company, AT&T, gain cost synergies, that's their term, not mine, of more than $1.6 billion per year within three years, and that overall combined AT&T and DirecTV would be able to offer... In AT&T's words again, quote, a pay TV, broadband, and mobile service bundle to at least 70 million customer locations and a pay TV and wireless service bundle to approximately another 45 million U.S. customer locations. It'll also help AT&T counter Comcast's planned acquisition of Time Warner Cable. Don't forget that part. It's kind of important. In a moment, if you're sick of all the glass holes in your neighborhood punk bar, you can learn how to fight fire with fire. If you don't know where the glass hole is, I'm going to tell you about that too. 
And in just a minute, Chris O'Brien from the Los Angeles Times will talk more about some iOS 8 features that you might not have heard about at WWDC, but probably are coming anyway. But first, let's thank Full Sail University for sponsoring this episode of TN2. Marketers need to know how to use advanced web-based tools, right? They need to know the right techniques to reach the audiences that they're, they're, they're trying to reach. Consumers, it's all digital now. So online marketing elements like web-based channels and search technologies and analytics drive today's advertising and brand strategies. Full Sail University's online internet marketing master's degree program is designed for professionals who want to keep pace with all of these marketing technologies. There's a lot to do. Courses like search engine optimization, social media marketing, web metrics analytics, online consumer behavior, the list goes on. Students work on real projects with real clients. They gain experience, they get results, and they learn from industry experienced instructors. Full Sail University's online and campus degree programs focus on education and experience with industry tech, and also workflow. It's an innovative curriculum. And here's the kicker. You can earn your master's degree in just 12 months. Along with internet marketing, Full Sail offers a variety of master's degrees in related fields, including business intelligence, innovation and entrepreneurship, and even new media journalism. To learn more about Full Sail's master's degree program in internet marketing or any of their related programs, check out fullsail.edu slash tn2. That's fullsale.edu slash TN and the number two. And thanks to Full Sail University for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, joining me now is the Los Angeles Times technology reporter, Chris O'Brien. Going to talk a little bit more about some features of iOS 8 that you might not have heard about. Hey, Chris. Hey, Sarah, how are you? I'm very well. Thanks for joining us. Okay, let's, let's start with this JavaScript engine. Okay, so all apps in iOS 8 going forward will be able to use the same improved JavaScript engine that powers Safari. Now, why weren't they already allowed to do that? Well, why they weren't allowed to do it, uh, someone secretly at Apple probably knows the answer to that. But <laughs> apparently when there was a switch to iOS 7 last year, they didn't have quite the same access to that as they had in the past. And uh, that, as you can imagine, generated some... Uh, you know, minor complaints from developers and, and other app makers. And so now it sounds like very quietly with the latest uh, iOS rollout, Apple has given them that access back. And, uh, and you know, for, for consumers, it'll be a subtle thing. But, you know, when you open those browsers and those apps, you should get, uh, you know, load times and response on par when, when you're using the uh, Safari browser. Now, I can understand why an app like Twitter or Facebook or some other app that, yeah, has that kind of inline browser, that, that's just a win for consumers. But it would also mean that Google's Chrome browser on iOS will be as quick as Safari. Is that something? I mean, I guess Apple doesn't want to do that, but are they sort of forced if they let some apps use that, then they kind of have to, they can't actually just throttle Google. Yeah, I, well, throttle is an interesting word to use there. I mean, yeah, you have to be careful, of course, because if you start playing favorites uh, when you're a company the size of Apple, uh, that can invite all sorts of fun uh, FTC scrutiny and other fun things that generally you want to stay away from. So you've got to, on a certain level, keep the uh, the playing field level. But, um, you know, there, there was some also chatter at, at the developers conference this week that Apple was uh, giving a little bit more nod to some of its competitors. So we'll see if that actually translates into uh, a, fl a friendlier playground. But, uh, yeah, you've got to kind of keep it level for everyone. Seems like Apple is really, you know, the, the, the whole idea of opening up is um, it, more than ever this week, at least. Uh, yeah. you know, we'll we'll see. Standards. Exactly, exactly. All right, well, let's move on to uh, this is another sort of little, little interesting thing. I saw some screenshots today of people saying, whoa, if this happened on Android, people would freak out. So the deal is, is that Apple wants relevant app icons that you don't have installed on your iPhone yet to pop up if you're near a location like a Starbucks or even an Apple store where you might actually be able to use that app to either have a better experience or you know, get a coupon or that sort of thing. So if you were at a Starbucks, for example, you get a little Starbucks app icon in the lower left corner, even if your phone is locked. Now, I'm already hearing from people that this is way too pushy. What do you think about it? Yeah, it's very tricky. And especially when you fold in the element of location, uh, there's a potential creepy factor 
that people get nervous that uh, Apple and all these other folks are kind of following you around and what location are you really sharing and how intentional is that? Um, but I think the flip side of, you know, the dilemma that Apple faces or the challenge kind of moving ahead with developers is that, you know, it's trying to find ways to help you and me and, uh, and other folks find and discover these apps. And then once we do use them more. Mm -hmm. And so that's the balance here is, you know, there's eight bazillion apps in the app store. So, you know, how are you finding it? And there were all sorts of other things they rolled out this week to, to kind of find different ways to highlight stuff that they think you're going to like. Um, but this is, I think, another element of that, just trying to surface that stuff that they think you're going to be useful. And then what it'll come down to is, you know, once it's in the field and people are using it, you know, is it serving up stuff that you, you look at and you think, wow, I'm so glad I knew to tap on that ad or that, that app uh, and use it because it turned out to be really useful. If it does, it could be a hit. Um, if you feel like you're just getting these little nudges all day, then it becomes an annoyance. Right. It was just, uh, I, I, that's why I turned off uh, that feature for my Foursquare app. We've got a couple people in our chat room saying you could just turn location off. Of course, that would disable this functionality because then right. the Apple wouldn't know where you were. I do wonder, though, if you're if you're in a Starbucks or really close to a Starbucks, does, is that going to get precedence over some other app that could also be helpful when you're in that exact location? I wonder how Apple will weight these apps and who gets uh, the front and center uh, little icon because you're not going to have a little dash of five of them. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And, and you know, these are tricky because the ones we're sort of talking about were not necessarily ones that they highlighted on stage or have talked a lot about. They've sort of been, you know, discovered as developers have started playing with this stuff. So that's an excellent question. I mean, do they have a partnership with Starbucks? Is Starbucks paying for placement? I mean, how does that all work? It's a little bit of a, a mystery, obviously, right now. And again, um, you know, I would I would fall on the side of being more transparent about how that works is better, but it is Apple we're talking about, so we'll see how how much they kind of open the door and and explain that all to us. Finally, this is this is actually kind of a feature that I'm surprised we didn't hear about because it seems great. iOS eight letting you skip connecting to a Wi-Fi network in order to share media via AirPlay. It'll now be peer to peer AirPlay support. So you could share content to an AirPlay-capable device as long as you can make a direct connection. Again, my question is, why didn't we already have this? Well, we, we could probably say that for almost half the things we saw on <laughs> Monday. Um, you know, it's all stuff that, you know, like you, you know, we talk to people about this stuff and you think, well, why couldn't I send a file from AirDrop to my Mac? I mean, what, what right. took them a whole nother year to roll that thing out? It seemed deadly obvious and it's made it far less useful than it would be. I, again, I think that kind of sums up for me anyways, the, the big takeaway from that show, it was lots of these little incremental uh, improvements that may seem obvious, but at the same time, you're happy to have it. It should make sharing in our lives easier. And, uh, you know, if it goes as planned from Apple side, we'll be engaging and using their stuff even more and we'll be more happier. So, We'll see if that's the case, but again, you know, I'm I'm an Apple TV fan, and I I use AirPlay a fair bit, so I'm I'm happy to see it get even more useful and be easier to use. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, last question for me: what What did you What excited you most about? You know, either either what was announced on stage at the keynote on Monday, or just the 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 stuff that's been trickling out with developers who have been fooling around with the dev version of iOS eight uh, all week. Well, it wasn't, it probably wasn't one single thing. I think it was more of a general vibe. Um, you know, it was funny if you, if you followed uh, uh, the stream or the show, depending on for folks out there who were there or not there. I mean, it was, it was fairly muted for a long time. And then towards the end, when they really started talking about developer stuff, uh, those, those developers were pretty juiced up. Uh, and I think that's the thing I came away with is that, I mean, frankly, even if some of the really under the hood stuff, I didn't 100% understand uh, how it was going to work. Um, you know, to see their community pretty excited means uh, I think they, they claim they came away overall with a win probably on Monday. Uh, if, if those folks are going to dig in even harder to the Apple ecosystem, build even more stuff for them, you know, that's going to be the key going forward because I don't, think we're seeing or hearing any big hardware breakthroughs coming anytime soon. And so really, 
you know, the question is, how are they going to help me get more out of the stuff I have? Because uh, again, I'm a, and I'm Apple household. So, uh, you know, if, if I can do more with the stuff that I have, that's great. And that's going to make me a more loyal Apple person. Chris O'Brien reports, the technology reporter for the Los Angeles Times. Thanks so much for being with us, Chris. And tell folks where they can keep up with you. Uh, LATimes.com and uh, Twitter at O'Brien. It's a good Twitter name, by the way. It is a good Twitter name. But a lot of you, <laughs> but you're but you're the only O'Brien. Good work. That's Thanks right. so much for being with us, Thanks. Chris. Take care. Finally, okay, I mentioned glass holes. If you hate the idea of being recorded by the dreaded glass hole, that means... Well, it's supposed to mean a person that wears Google Glass, but also forgets their manners. Not all Google Glass wearers are glass holes. Berlin artist Julian Oliver has written a program called glasshole.sh that detects any glass device that's attempting to connect to a Wi-Fi network based on a unique character string that he says he's found in the MAC address of Google's augmented reality headsets. Now, you can use Oliver's program on a Raspberry Pi or something called a BeagleBone mini computer, which is like the cutest name for a computer ever, and plug it into a USB network antenna, and then the gadget becomes a Google Glass detector. It sniffs the local network for signs of glass users. When it detects glass, it uses a program called Aircrack, dash NG to impersonate the network and then send a deauthorization command which cuts the Wi-Fi connection. It can also emit a little beep to signal the glassware's presence to anybody near Y. Like, ah, glassware incoming. Oliver explains that, quote, these are cameras, highly surreptitious in nature with network backup function and no external indication of recording. To focus on the device is to dance past a heritage of heartfelt protest against the unconsented video documentation of our public places and spaces. Hmm. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Plus, don't miss our morning news program. If you're not already subscribed, Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.